I think we'll get started. Um, I'm, my name is Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of the Overseas Press Club. Thank you all for coming. Um, we, uh, it will be, we're taping it too, so you can check the website later and, or tell your friends. And um, Marcus Mabry, the president of the Overseas Press Club, should be here in a bit, and he can, he'll tell you a little bit more about the club. But it's only twenty dollars if you're under thirty. So. We're, and we're doing more and more programs um, for training and for journalists who are just starting out. So um, check out our website and, uh, and our programs. So this is Liam Stack from the New York Times, who's our moderator. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to our panel tonight on how to freelance safely, uh, sponsored by the Overseas Press Club and the Dark Center for Journalism Trauma. As Patty said, I'm Liam Stack. I'm a New York Times journalist and a board member of the Overseas Press Club. And before working in New York, I spent seven years as a freelancer in Cairo. Um, so this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm sure it's news to no one in this room that the news business is changing um, very dramatically, very quickly. And there are a few places where that is more apparent than in the realm of foreign reporting. Uh, traditional news outlets are closing down bureaus, some digital organizations, you just mentioned Vice, are you know, contracting uh, freelancers or opening bureaus of their own. But at the end of the day, freelancers are doing more and more of the work with fewer and fewer resources. Um, in short, it's a dangerous business, and it seems like it's getting more so every day. Uh, the kidnapping and murder of several journalists in Syria in recent months uh, really drives home the importance of considering safety and security before you embark on a freelance career overseas. Um, I think that our panelists tonight um, we'll be able to give you all of us some valuable insights um, in that regard. So without further ado, I'll introduce the members of our panel. Uh, we'll speak for a few minutes before we open the floor up uh, to questions. Um, my left is Sawyer Alberry, who is the lead trainer for Risk, uh, which is reporters, instructed in saving colleagues, and the Wilderness Medical Associates, as well as an adjunct faculty member at Johnson State College in Vermont. She's a member of the Vermont National Guard and served two tours of duty, first as a flight medic in Iraq in 2006, and again as a combat medic in Afghanistan in uh, 2010. Next we have Judith uh, Matloff, who is a staff foreign correspondent for 20 years, most recently as the Africa of Moscow Bureau Chief of the Christian Science Monitor. That's where I started out as a great answer. Um, she's a contributing editor in the Columbia Journalism Review, a uh, professor here at Columbia. She has authored two books, and she uh, pioneered safety training for journalists around the world. Next is Mikey Garrett, who is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, writer, photographer, and the founder of Four Corners Media. He's been working as an independent filmmaker and journalist in conflict and post-conflict zones for the past 14 years. Uh, his book, American Hostage, is a memoir about his kidnapping in Iraq in 2004. And at the end is Vaughn Smith. Uh, the founder of the Frontline Club in London, uh, which is an institution to champion independent journalism and promote better understanding of international news and its coverage. During the 1990s, he worked as an award-winning independent cameraman and video news journalist, uh, covering the wars and conflict in Iraq, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Chechnya, Kosovo, and elsewhere. Uh, so each of our panelists, as I said, will speak for a few minutes, uh, and then we will open the floor to the questions. Uh, Sawyer, would you like to Sure. Again? Uh, again, my name is Sawyer Albert, and uh, I'm here for Risk. As uh, many of you know, the, the, the beginnings of Risk is, was a little bit of a tragic one. Uh, Tim Hetherington was killed in Liberia in 2011, and his good friend Sebastian Uger uh, started this organization, this nonprofit organization, in order to train and equip freelance journalists who are going into complex zones. So the course that we created uh, for RISK to, uh, to train these folks is a four-day course uh, that uh, teaches journalists how to save themselves and maybe some other colleagues. Uh, and, and mostly we focus on the four preventable deaths on the battlefield, uh, the, the evidence that shows that people most likely are going to die from bleeding to death. And so we spend a lot of time uh, trying to teach people how to not bleed to death, but how to prevent that problem from happening. Uh, I started this personally in, in my life because I was in Afghanistan, as you said, in 2010, and I, I frequently sat next to people in convoy trucks that were contractors, uh, reporters, journalists, and those types of folks, and I would sit there and think to myself, I wonder if I got hurt, would this person be able to save my life? 
And inevitably, the answer was no, because they weren't trained, they weren't equipped, they didn't know what to do. And so this is, uh, you know, really came home for me, and, and given the opportunity to, to teach this course for risk and to train people in how to save themselves and others, that uh, was really, really important to do that. So we've been doing this for, for quite a while now. <clears throat> um, our first course was on the anniversary of Tim Hetherington's death in 2012. We've run eight courses since then. 192 students have gone through the, the, the four-day course. And uh, we've done courses in the Bronx, the Bronx Documentary Center, uh, in London at the Frontline Club, uh, in Nairobi most recently, and also this last summer in Kosovo. So it's been a really great time to do all that. Um, there's the problem with the uh, battlefield is that we don't always know how people die. We know how they get killed, but not necessarily physiologically how they die. Most notably, we know that bleeding is the biggest problem, but there's always air also airway management problems. There's uh, tension in the thorax problems, and, there's, and remarkably, there's hypothermia problems. So these four deaths, the people that uh, in conflict zones run into quite frequently, they don't really need to. And so having a course designed for this uh, to prevent these battlefield deaths is important. Um, yeah, that one, there. <laughs> um, I, I teach here at Columbia, and actually we're into our fourth year now of offering safety training for freelancers and people who actually work in the profession. Sawyer is also our medical trainer, and I, I can't stress enough that it's incumbent on freelancers to seek out whatever training they can get. One of the most tragic things about the industry is with the implosion of um, organizations organized organizations is that in the past, for instance, when, when Rob from CPJ and I worked for, for Reuters, you, you had the benefit of mentoring. You had the benefit of the experienced people. They didn't send you out covering a conflict until they were absolutely sure that you knew what you were doing. You might not have known what you were doing, but you had, you had a network of people to rely on and resources to get you in and out of places. You had people with whom you could talk about, is this the proper thing to do, is this not? You were constantly doing reality checks with your editors and your colleagues. And what I find so frightening about the freelance environment is that people are just totally on their own. And they're oftentimes relying on the judgment of other people who are just as experienced mm -hmm. as themselves. And for economic expediency, you often see freelancers teaming up together which can lend emotional support, but not necessarily the kind of reality check that you might need from more experienced persons. So again, you know, whatever, I, I think it's incumbent on organizations, media organizations that hire freelancers to offer them the training, the resources to get in and out. If you're going to hire somebody, you should try to protect them. But at the same time, I think freelancers have to accept their own limitations. If you don't have the money for training, um, don't go to a place like Syria. Don't make that your first assignment. There are plenty of really important stories that you can do first before you cut your teeth and get a little bit more secure about Um Hi. So, I, yeah, I've been working, and I, I would say sort of as a freelancer for 14 years. Um, I, I call it independent because uh, 14 years ago I founded a company with my partner, and so it's always been two of us or three of us, you know, very small. But that was one of the first ways that, that uh, what I did to try to protect myself was to actually have it not just be me, but to, you know, at least two of us, and, um, sometimes three, maybe four sometimes. Um, and that's really important because, as Judith is saying, finding um, a support network, you know, even if it's small, is incredibly uh, important. It's probably the most important thing you can do to start if you're independent. Um, I would have to say I was, uh, you know, I've, I've seen sort of a lot of the things that people get into. I was kidnapped in Iraq in 2004. In 2009, I was hit with an IED in Afghanistan. In 2011, I was caught up in a massacre in Egypt. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been very lucky. And each time I keep wondering, you know, is this luck or am I doing something right? And I'd have to say, you know, mostly it's luck. But there are some things that you can do to protect yourself. Um, and it's getting harder and harder these days. Um, you know, particularly if you look at places like Syria. Um, you know, there's certain situations that there's almost nothing you can do. So I think being aware of that um, is key. And a lot of times, you know, freelancers lack the information because they don't have the network behind them. They don't have, you know, the, the major news organization that's going to have somebody on payroll who's doing sort of threat analysis, um, 
you know, a great example is, you know, I used to travel in and out of Iraq. I was there five times, and um, the last time I, I had the luxury of a major news organization offered to pick me up at the airport, and they picked me up in an unmarked, you know, sedan that happened to be sort of bulletproof. It had, you know, really thick, you know, so $500,000 vehicle, and there were two security guards inside. And I just thought, you know, gosh, I've never seen this before. Um, and I don't know if I felt safer, but it was interesting when I compared that to what I had done for the, you know, the previous four trips. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think for all of us, you know, getting into your questions would be great, so I'm going to end it there and answer questions. Um, <coughs> conflict journalism is dangerous. And the risks can only be completely avoided by not doing the journalism in the first place. I once had to tell some parents that their son, a freelance cameraman, uh, had been killed. I ran a freelance TV news, agency, TV news agency in the 1990s, and half of us were killed in the course of our work. We had a calling for journalism and believed in it. Um, I would do it again, despite the risk. I think we have to change the way we perceive journalists who get killed. We don't want it to happen, but when it does, we need to value those who have perished rather than lose confidence in what we or they do. Freelance operators have become, on the whole, more experienced in covering conflicts than our employed colleagues. <coughs> but we still too often are portrayed as lesser journalists by them when the hand-wringing about journalism safety starts. Freelancers are cynical when patronised by those news outfits that don't pay them fairly and shirk any responsibility for their safety. If we want to help freelancers, we must correct negative assumptions about them. In truth, freelancers, freelance content has now become indispensable. Without freelancers today, reporting would be reliant on material from activists, fighters, and local propagandists. Freelancers have been a professional influence on news gathering. For example, the very first news safety course was run in London in 1993 by a company called AKE. It was inspired by freelancers. I know this because I, 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 I instruct them. Freelancers lack resources, but the very many serious ones have no lack of integrity um, or commitment, and there is a long-established freelance practice in mentoring. For these reasons, 18 months ago, I joined with seven other freelancers to create a representative body uh, for conflict independence. It's called the Frontline Freelance Register, FFR for short, and it has 400 registrants. Nothing like it has existed before. FFR exists for us to help each other, to reassure the public about our ethics and organize ourselves to improve our collective safety. We wanted to provide a vehicle for serious freelancers to separate themselves from those that are not. And unfortunately, there are very many that are not. There are already excellent organizations that help freelancers, but none others have a democratic mandate to speak on their behalf as we do. We want to work with news organizations to improve freelance safety. But I want to talk a bit about how freelancers view things. Two thirds, and I've done this on the basis of um, uh, a survey of our 400 registrants, two thirds of them are freelance out of choice. These are not people who can't get a job in the industry or necessarily want a job in the industry. They want to be the freest part of a free press. 85% are still dependent on the traditional industry to get journalism out. Um, hopefully that will reduce, but it's still the fact. Disturbingly, a third of FFR registrants answers that they thought the editors they sell to don't care about their safety at all. Most of all, freelancers want to work and to be paid fairly for it. Paying $100, normally rather late, for an article from a war zone is a payment that contains no contribution towards the cost of freelance safety. Discussing freelance safety without discussing the payments freelancers receive is to normalize this exploitation. It happens far too often. The real way to make conflict reporting safer for freelancers is to value freelancers more. Reflecting on my 25 years as a freelance, it's hard not to conclude three things. The freelance community is here to stay. It's very good for journalism. And there has been a general shortfall of funding, leadership, and guidance for freelancers from the news industry. Freelance journalists are more than just banal purveyors of an economic commodity that can be bought on the cheap with a clear conscience. Freelancers have delivered inexpensive and largely unattributed content to news organizations over that time, which triggers the question from them to misquote Janet Jackson, what have you done for us lately? Okay, so what can be done? 
a big worry for freelancers is the nature of corporate legal responsibility. At the moment, news organizations are discouraged from using freelancers properly because the possible cost when it goes wrong. Families and freelance journalists have been known to sue. Freelancers want these legal responsibilities more clearly defined, and it's key to get for us to get more work. Relationships will be more stable if liability is clearer and is contained. We can standardize new safety training courses, for example, in a way that will allow freelancers to achieve recognizable qualifications. These don't exist. It's quite unbelievable. This would encourage freelancers to meet these standards. We can collaborate to unlock better insurance options. We can help FFR, my organization, with its draft code of practice for working with freelance. I've got a draft here. I should have a bit of paper, but it's on my phone. That's the digital world for you. More dramatic, I guess, with a bit of paper. Finally, freelance safety needs to be funded. That cost is not being covered at the moment by an industry that has not reconciled itself properly to the dependence it's had on freelance. <laughs> <laughs> I even wrote it, actually, normally I just yeah. talk about it, but I thought I'd try it this time. <laughs> just to interject briefly, uh, we just sort of reminded me when I was freelancing, um, in the very beginning of my career in Cairo, I was freelancing as a Christian science monitor for my first year, and I'd come back the first time to Boston to meet the editors for the first time. And this was about a year after Jill Carroll had been released. Jill was actually my, my entry point in the organization. She, was, she talked me up to that. <clears throat> so I met with the editor um, and had lunch and asked if I wanted to go to Baghdad. And this was in 2007. And I said, depends um, what kind of security preparations you guys prepared to provide for me. And they said, how much of that would you be willing to pay for yourself? <laughs> That's the one there. Okay. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. And I was, you know, 24. Uh, I, I ended up not going to Baghdad in the end. Though. <laughs> but, yeah, so, anyway, um, I guess we'll open the floor for questions. Um. Um, you talked about the corporate legal responsibilities. Um, I am interested in hearing more about that and what you think can be done on the legal perspective of things, kind of like working out some form of policies where maybe we could try to pass something where you need to educate journalists who are going to go and work freelance abroad. Um, mostly, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one is, what are your views on the way that they define legally the difference between a journalist and a freelance journalist, and if something happens, um, um, I forgot the word, it was either you're like considered like it was a war crime versus there's something about how war journalists are protected in a slightly different way and their work is defined differently than just journalists. And if they happen to be imprisoned, it's considered differently than what a journalist is in prison while reporting. Well, I'm quite shocked to hear that. I didn't know that, I must say, because it's, it's just absolutely disgrace. I mean, there's no difference at all, really. I mean, we're all journalists. You know, you don't have to work for the BBC to be a journalist. You have to subscribe to some value. I think what you mean is that in a situation where the laws of war apply, right. killing a journalist is a war crime. Protected but that action. wouldn't be applicable in a situation like where we are right now, where the laws of war don't apply. No, definitely. I'm more referring to, for instance, um, uh, someone goes to report and they get arrested while reporting, and they can be considered a war prisoner versus not. It's, no, it's, it's written, written down, I'm not clear to make it up, I promise. It's, 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 the, the values of Geneva Convention. Yeah, so exactly. It's unless like the article. Geneva Convention is, is uh, respected in that area, or if war is declared, then then otherwise you don't have any special privileges in that regard. But war hasn't declared before it is. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the point you well, about well, well, no, but, the, the, but the laws of war apply even if they don't, you don't have to declare war for the International Red Cross, for instance, to conclude yeah. that the laws of war apply. Um, the, the point about corporate responsibility, just to clarify what, what that is, um, I've spoken to quite a lot of broadcasters particularly, um, and their big concern is, um, is, is, is costs that they can't predict. It's the unpredictability that is the biggest worry. Was, uh, news organization might be quite prepared on certain uh, instances to take full responsibility for you. It depends what you're going to deliver. But the point is, it's, it's hard for them to take a judgment on what their liability is. Um, and that means that there's a tendency towards saying, bring it back, 
um, and if we like it, we'll buy it. And of course, they've done that, but they won't therefore contribute you know, to the, the trip and take any responsibility for it. And, and so it's, it's, we believe that if there was a, a, a clarity on what responsibility news organizations have, and it may well be that freelancers can help deliver some of that by perhaps limiting the liability <coughs> themselves, then we could, we could come to an area where and we can work more, because that's what we want to do. Well, I think, I mean, just from my experience in 14 years, I have, I mean, it's perfect clarity. Yeah. They take no responsibility at all. I mean, I've never, I've, I've published, you know, in countless places, and I've never once felt the organization I was working with would take a single shred of responsibility if anything happened to me. And so I've gone into it with that expectation, and I'm sure they would back me up on that. The, the only caveat to that is that some organizations do take, you know, a moral responsibility. And when I was kidnapped, there was one um, large news organization who I was freelancing for on occasion. You know, I didn't have a real solid relationship, but they did a lot behind the scenes, you know, purely out of their own, you know, we feel like we want to help. Um, so, you know, news organizations can be extremely active and do a lot, but on a legal front, you know, that that's such a gray or dark area because they legally don't want to sign anything that's going to say you have, you know, you are going to be responsible, like $5 million insurance or whatever, you know. And so I, I, it's that's how that's how in my experience it works. But I honestly don't know how that would change without something like a a union of freelancers to push that or, or some you know. Well, that's what we but, are actually. But yeah. but even if you have a union, you know, when people talk about the media, it's not one monolithic mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. You know, Vice is not Fox, and each organization is going to have its own corporate culture and. The other thing is, you know, I also think it varies from story to story. Um, I know certainly now, currently with Ebola, there are certain employers that are refusing to send freelance photographers out unless they have insurance. Now, that doesn't solve the problem because you can have insurance and then you can't get a carrier to take you back to the States for treatment. But, I, you know, again, I think it, it, overall what Michael is saying is true. You, you really can't expect any coverage. but then it can vary from organization to organization. The other thing is that, wouldn't you agree, Michael, that if you have a, an established relationship with an organization, you, they're more likely to go and help you? Like like that yeah. big organization you talked about, you had already done work for them, so they were willing to go that extra mile to get you out. Right? Yeah, I mean, so much of it is, is yeah, pure personal, relationships. You know. Because we've hardly, I mean, in 14 years, I, I until the last year, I don't think I'd ever signed a contract in my life. You know, and only recently have we, because we've gotten larger documentary projects. And, but, you know, it's always been, you know, even after I've sold something to somebody, I've never, I have no contract, no paperwork, you know, it's been. But it really varies. And then I, I, there's a magazine I worked for in Montreal, and I have to sign a contract every time they commission something. And when I went to Dagestan for them, they were absolutely adamant that I take certain precautions and that I arrange insurance. So, again, yeah, it varies. Yeah, it, it varies. It is, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been working in Guatemala as a freelancer for the past eight years, and although um, Guatemala is not a conflict zone, um, it is one of the most dangerous countries in the world that are not at war. Um, so there's a lot of things that you talked about that would apply to that context, and the violence in Central America is more to do with drug trafficking and organized crime. Do you have any specific advice about how to deal with those situations, like, for example, um, kidnapping threats, like other than just leaving the country. I mean, do you have like, any sort of specific points that would apply to the context of Latin America and drug violence? Oh, we spent a whole day talking about that. I do a lot of tra safety training with Mexican journalists. I mean, if you want, we can talk afterwards. But I mean, I could talk for hours about that. One of the, when, when, when we designed the risk course, we, we, do, we had spent a lot of time on the quote, preventable deaths in the battle. It's very sexy, it's very exciting, it's smoke and mirrors and loud noises and things. But the reality is that more people get sick than they do get blown up. And that is, that's statistically just true. So the, what we do when we, in the risk course is we actually spend quite a bit of time on travel medicine, because uh, all of you guys have been traveling somewhere and you get sick, right? And you think you're, to yourself, geez, what do I do? Do I do what my grandmother told me? Do I do what I saw on TV one day? Or do I do what I think is right or this guy told me? And so just having some, a chance to kind of learn, relearn some of that first aid, that travel medicine first aid, um, is a good place to start. Because the, the reality is you're more likely to get into a car wreck or, or come down with traveler's diarrhea than you are to get shot or injured out there. And so, you know, in that process, 
you know, teaching yourself and learning about all of these things as well as what you do, you know, and that just seems like general travel knowledge, but it's true, and I think that it's overlooked quite frequently. And we've, we've gotten tons of emails back from students who have done this stuff that have made those, uh, that we had just had one the other day, someone that used a, uh, some of the travel medicine we teach about, um, they stepped on a stingray, and, they, and the student knew what to do. I mean, you know, that's not no normally in your thought process, geez, I'm going to be a conflict journalist, I better know what to do if a stingray comes and gets me. Uh, but certainly that, that stuff is useful, and I think that, you know, you have to think outside the box. You have to think about just traveling in general to these dangerous places, not you know, not just specifically to the areas that you're going to be in, and just some of those very sexy explosion type things, injuries. Because you guys are going to get hurt, no matter what you do out there. Uh, you're going to get sick. You're going to get hurt. Uh, all those things you need to be prepared for, and that's part of it. But having said that, dealing with narcos, I think you should take your lead from your local journalists. I mean, if you if you're in Mexico, most people can't report openly if they're on on the whole cartel situation. I mean, there's there is. There is enormous amount of self censorship where people have moved on to other beats, and I think what you you know if you really want to get a sense of just what the actual dangers are, talk to the local journalists in Guatemala. Well, um, I, I work for both local media, right. and um, I do a lot of reporting in Spanish, and I, right. I, I work for foreign media as well. And yeah. you know, one interesting thing that I've actually found is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes there's small um, local media organizations that will protect you more than the large international organizations. Yeah. Which is why you should talk to them. The, the organization that is like, protected here the most is um, a website called Plaza Publica. It's a small, independent, um, online publication, and they actually got me life insurance, like they do with all their other reporters. They treat freelancers exactly the same as everybody else. Um, and no other media like international or from wherever is done without warning, the family of being was in my life. But, but that won't help you with precautions. And, you know, I think part of the problem in Central America and Mexico is that a lot of newsrooms are compromised. So you don't necessarily know if you can trust your colleagues. Um, I, you know, there's a phenomenal group that I've been working with in Mexico called Family Beast, that's the FBA, and they it's a trusted network of people, and to a certain degree, it's underground. I don't know if something like that specifically exists in Guatemala, but you might want to make contact with this particular group, because a lot of people go back and forth across the border. But you have to be really, really, really careful about who you're working with and with whom you're, you're, you're discussing the work that you're doing. You know, I don't know if you're covering the drug beat at all, or just random violence, because that's also very, very different. If you're doing investigations, into organized crime, that you, it's, it's really, really dangerous. Yeah. You have to secure your communication. Fortunately, um, that's not the main focus of my work. Like, okay. The result I do like, pretty much everything, but um, I've focused more and more on things like transitional justice in Guatemala, yeah. um, feminicide, those are like more the areas that I work on, but um, on a number of occasions it's inevitable living in a country like Guatemala that right. a big story will break out and they'll ask me to do the drug story. Right, but and also the femicides are linked to the drug activity. Yeah. So, you know, you may think you're just doing, doing something about a woman who's been bludgeoned by a boyfriend, but actually there could be a wider story behind it in connection to organized crime. You just have to be really careful to secure your digital, your digital communications also. Um, are, are you a U.S. citizen? Or? No, okay. Because okay. I mean, a big issue, you know, kidnapping, of course, is a huge issue in Central America. And, um, you know, the, the the U.K. government functions a lot like the U.S. government in that regard in terms of how it handles it, um, and which basically means that you know, if you're screwed. Um, you know, put it bluntly, um, ransom is the sort of dirty secret of kidnapping, and some countries pay, some won't. And so if you're a French citizen and you're kidnapped, there's a much stronger likelihood the government's going to pay the ransom to get you out. So you should think about things like kidnapping insurance, which is a whole strange, dark world. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, it's something that if you find yourself in that position, you really don't want to be alone. Um, you know, particularly if people are starting to knock on the door for you know millions of dollars. So. You know, there are certain parts of the world where you really have to think about that, and I think Central America is one where you're going to take they, usually don't, they usually just kill you, though. They usually don't hold you for long. They yeah. usually just... Yeah. So you can save yourself some money. <laughs> <laughs>
That's probably your biggest risk. I mean, y'all are traveling to these really exotic places, and, and that's inherently dangerous. And so, if you're not protecting yourself by by really doing some basic knowledge on first aid and safety and travel, I mean, you're going to lose. And that's you know that really is kind of what this is about. Is that people can't just willy nilly decide to go out and do this stuff. They have to really do a lot of tra professional training, and they have to do a lot of normal safety training that they would they, they would not normally have to do if they went to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower, for example. I mean, it's just not. You guys are doing something far more different than that. Defense, yeah. prepare for it. Defensive driving is really useful from that part of the well. I hear in Cairo as well. Yeah, exactly. In New York as well. Right. So basically, <laughs> take one of those courses. Well, we, if you want, we can talk. I don't want to monopolize the group, but we can we can talk afterwards and I can give you some specific stuff. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, if I made a kind of piggyback on what you were saying about going to exotic locations and they, by definition, being dangerous, um, could each of you or just whoever's got a good story about it kind of talk about um, kind of, even if it's not a, you know, a conflict zone or a war zone or even, you know, a, an Ebola zone, just when you're going to, you know, foreign land kind of doing risk assessment and then also just situational awareness of like, I'm new to this area, I'm new to this country, you know, how do I get used to it and kind of, you know, get savvy quick? Well, I would recommend first and foremost, you have to know your medical resources. I mean, you really do. You have to know where the hospital is, you have to know what they have, what they don't have. And, and where people are that can help you medically. I mean, if you don't have that type of information, some communication wow. system, I'm sure you'll talk about a picture, um, you, you're going to lose. The, you know, again, most of the medical training that we do, is, it's, it's, it's just like the pre-training you do before you go anywhere else. You have to do it. And if you don't, the moment when somebody gets blown up, it's not the time to think to yourself, oh, crap, where did I see that ambulance or that Red Cross or that Crescent Moon? You have to know this stuff first. Um, just like you sit in a cafe and would, you know, look around to see to try and get the story. You have to be looking around too and saying, all right, if, if we got blown up right now, what can I use for splinting material? If we got, you know, if if, if this thing went to hell in a handbasket, how would we get these people out of here? Uh, how would we carry them, and where would we carry them to? And what do I have with me that could help in that process? And if you're not doing some pre-work in that, you're going to lose, at least medically. And informationally, you know. Talk to your colleagues local and also expatriate. Who are the, the recommended drivers? Who are the local recommended fixers? Um, you're always going to be better off if you can speak the language. You're going to be able to negotiate your own situation, not work through a translator. Um, just who are your main sources going to be? What's your exit route going to be? What are the biggest dangers that you're going to face? Is it hostage taking? Is it bad roads? Is it you know, rape, and then work from there. What's the worst case scenario? And then try to mitigate the risk as much as you can. Who, you know, come up with an exit strategy if possible, and um, and also work out who who who's going to be the contact person if, if the shit hits the fan. It's going to be your family. Is it going to be your employer? I recommend that it's not your mother. I'm a mother. <laughs> I recommend that. Do not make it your mother. Um, you know, and and leave your passwords. I mean, you know. Get your will in order. I mean, really plan for the worst case scenario and make sure there's one point person who knows how to contact everybody and knows what to do. You know, do you want a publicity campaign launched if you're kidnapped? Do you want everything under the surface? You know, like kind of work all that stuff out before you go there. It's like carrying an umbrella. So, for those of you who work um, as correspondents in the field, is there any anecdote you have, any particular instance, you know, when you? Did these things when you were, you know, oh. when you when you were that, that you can share, you know, you, you were, It's you were, embarrassing. <laughs> well, I, I mean, things got crazy. Yes. You had your go-to plan, or I, I can tell you a couple. You know, there's a concept in journalism. You know, it's sort of one of the sexy ideas of parachute journalism. You, know, you go into a place, you don't know anything about it. You know, it's interesting, and it actually can lead to some interesting ideas because you see a place fresh for the first time. It's also very dangerous because you go into a place without knowing anything about it. And I feel like the most dangerous times are when you first show up there and then when you're too comfortable. And so it's like what they say about riding, riding a motorcycle. Most motorcycle accidents happen after you've ridden for like 100 hours um, because you feel comfortable. And you know, there's two, two examples I can give. When I was in um, Iraq in 2004, we had a lot of awareness on the ground because I'd spent a lot of time there. And I knew everything was changing constantly. This is just from fixers and people on the street, you know, just friends. 
you're just constantly going out to anyone who might have some information. And there was uh, a road from Baghdad to the south. There's sort of two roads. One went through Kut and one went through Mahmudia. And it became very clear to everyone that you do not take the one that goes through Mahmudia. Um, and it was you know, incredibly dangerous. And the last time I took it, we actually had to hide in the back of the car, like lie on the ground, have blankets over us. It was that bad. And then we just stopped. And shortly afterwards, a veteran Poland, Polish journalist who worked for 20 years in conflict zones came into Baghdad. He spent, I think, one or two days in Baghdad. And then he headed straight down to where the Polish were based, which was Babylon, straight through Mahmudia. He got into a car. He put what he thought was the safe thing to do, which was a big press sign in the back window. Right in Mahmudia, he was killed. You know, they saw the press sign and shot him. Um, and I like, you know, it's a very sad story, and I, I like to contrast that with, a, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, when I was in the south in Kandahar, uh, there was a woman coming out for the first time, her first overseas assignment, a very good journalist from Canada, and her very first time out, she went out in the safest possible way. She went out with, you know, 14-ton MRAP vehicles with the Canadian Army. It was an afternoon patrol through Kandahar, who was supposed to be a safe part, and the vehicle was destroyed with an IED and everyone was killed inside. So, you know, you had the first time out and your veteran, both of whom, you know, didn't have whatever. I mean, they didn't make mistakes, but they, you know, found themselves in a situation that wasn't something they could do anything about, that maybe wasn't enough situational awareness. I mean, I, you know, there's nothing you can say that anyone did wrong. It's just that you have to be extremely aware that there's no amount of information that's too much information. And I like to say that the, the, the time you should really think about it is not, you know, when, when you first get there, but also when you're ready to leave, because what a lot of people do is they save kind of the riskiest thing in the back of their mind for the end. Like, I'll do that story later, I'll, you know, and then when you, you're thinking about leaving, you're like, oh, I've, I've made it through this, and you tend to end up doing the thing that you'd put off. So if you're planning to leave, do not do that last story. <laughs> I just say that the OPC is trying to help out a little bit with practical resources with the global parachute for people who are, you know, which gives you practical guides to covering certain countries. And there are a lot of other online resources like specific Facebook groups of journalists for lots of different countries where you can go and just ask people for help and advice. And there's always the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is one of the best resources you can find, both in terms of preparing for your trip, but also when you're out there. Thank so, you know, definitely check in with them and see what they're recommending. Which is incredibly distinguished people who walk in the room. But may I just... David Rhodes is probably yeah. covered up there. Yes. Can't stand. Marcus Mabry. Marcus Mabry. President of Overseas Press Club. I want to sit here. <laughs> Emma Daly, who covered uh, Bosnia for the, the English newspapers, is on the board of OPC and is also with the Human Rights Watch, and Carly Sennett, who employed the young Foley, or had a working relationship with uh, Jim Foley in, in Syria. Also is on our board, the LPC Foundation. You guys sure you don't want to yeah, <laughs> <laughs> You can have my water. No, thanks. You guys are doing great. <laughs> you guys probably already talked about this before we came out. I apologize for being late. Um, did you talk about places you wouldn't go? Oh, yeah. That's a great question. I think I think journalists aren't always very good at judging risk, um, and that I think there needs to be a, a more professional approach to it. Uh, you should, if you take a risk, expect a, something back, you know, a story, and not all stories are worth a great deal of risk. And I think that um, managing risk and, and trying to discipline yourself, one to actually, I, I, when I go to do a story, I actually try to mathematically calculate that. It's incredibly difficult. It may not be very accurate. But it's a process that forces me to think about it all the time. Um, and I've always encouraged people not to take risk without the chance of reward. And it can be very difficult in, journal, in journalism because sometimes you're going out to check out if there is a story. But, but I think one has to be quite disciplined and quite professional. I think uh, if you can increase your professionalism, you will certainly increase your chances. Um, the other thing I observe is as a trade, still today, you can be on a story and go to the bar and somebody walks in because you found some bar somewhere and has this 
extraordinary story of daring do that may or may not be completely true. Um, and, and anyway, you listen to it and you think, blimey, why did they do that? And there's no sense of, oh, well, that was really stupid. But when a journalist gets killed, we get very excited about it and we try and analyze it and we try and, you know, there's invariably an assumption they've done something wrong. And I don't think that's very healthy because uh, the point that's been made about, it's very hard to train journalists in a pres about safety in a prescriptive way because it's, you really sometimes don't know. You could be going left or you could be going right. You could do this, you could do that. And sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't. And the thing that works is the thing that worked, if you see what I mean. So you've got to be a bit careful. You, you, it, the onus is on you as a, a, as a journalist in a conflict to uh, never daydream, always think what you're doing, and consider and, and have a safety route, as has been described, that, you know, that, that we can't teach you to do this or that. You have to ultimately work it out. What are your, your code, you say you have a code of practice, it's on your device, can you yes. just summarize it for us quickly? Um, gosh, I wonder if I can actually get it up. No, I'll try and summarize it. Essentially what, it, what it's trying to deal with is it's the, it's the kind of freelance part of it, and I think there should be an industry part of it, um, where it essentially says, look, we'd like to be paid within maybe 30 days or something like that. Um, uh, but uh, the average is something like 78 or something, yeah, it's absurd. Um, and, 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 it, and it expresses the point that freelancers do require the money from the last job sometimes to fund the next job. So it's actually having an impact on journalism, on our output, and, and we care about that. Um, it talks about uh, the, the idea that there needs to be greater pay for dangerous work, and that there must be some consideration for the costs of safety. And one of the points I've, I've, I've tried to make as strong as possible is that um, the way to fix uh, this, one way to really make a difference, is to actually pay us better. Uh, that then we can afford to have safety. You can't expect us to do certain things on the safety dimension if we can't afford it, um, because we're not being remunerated for it. It talks about the importance of trying to, uh, it, it deals with this point I made about uh, legal responsibility and trying to, uh, to an extent, contain it, but, uh, but, but, but uh, define it correctly, so that we all know what, what, is, what is it. It, it. it insists that before engaging a freelance, uh, these things must be discussed. We're not necessarily saying, no, we have to be insured, we have to be this, necessarily. I think ultimately it's up to the freelancer to decide what he's prepared to do. But there has to be that discussion, it has to be clear. There's nothing worse than not knowing. Um, and um, I'm trying to think what, what else has gone on it, because it took ages to draw, to tell you. Um, what, do you it, what do you say about training? How do you spell the need for training? Should journals be... Uh, well, to, to, join, um, to, to have actually joined FFR, you have to commit yourself to... Um, a, a code of conduct, um, and that includes to take uh, to be professional about safety. Um, we're going to insist that everybody's up to date on first aid, and that's we're in the process of doing that. But I think that's absolutely uh, 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 essential, and the reason it's essential, I think we've, we've said that, is very often you team up, um, and you can be with somebody who who you might be able to help. You can't necessarily always help yourself, but you have a responsibility as a journalist to be able to help others with you. I think that is non-negotiable, um, and you still meet these old crusty journalists who can't do safe first aid and go to free the war days and they shouldn't be allowed however crusty and important and big foot footed they are um, but so uh, we, we do talk about training but but essentially uh, on on the training we've already made this commitment to join FFR to be taken as a, a serious freelance we, we, we believe that people have to commit themselves in a way I think the industry doesn't anyway uh, to uh, always uh, be improving your safety it's it's like uh, you know, it's the practical side of journalism. I mean, the thing about journalism is we, we, we somehow believe that it's a, just an intellectual exercise when covering wars has a massive practical component to it. Um, and it's trying to promote that as a sort of professional thing. I'd like to interject one part of this thing, which is, you know, when Marcus and I covered Africa in the 90s, there wasn't a safety industry. I mean, some of the insane stuff we did when I think back to Kinshasa and whatnot and South Africa going to those townships and foreign in the morning, CPJ was not as much of a force to reckon with. So, you know, I think we're also more <coughs> hyper aware of safety now than we were before, which is a very, very good thing. But, you know, the world was always dangerous before, and I think I think the industry has moved on, even though freelancers are getting an awful deal. I know freelancer too, so I agree with you, they're getting an awful deal. But I think I think we also have to look at the positive side of it, which is as a medical provider, almost all of my patients start off their story with, it seemed like a good idea at the time. 
<laughs> and I think that one of the things that's good about this, you know, I'm being the only non-journalist in this room here, is that, uh, you know, what I've seen personally in, in my involvement over this is I've seen an awareness. I've seen communities starting to be building. Um, you know, we have uh, this great, you know, the risk Facebook is ridiculous. I live all my, my life vicariously through you all now. Uh, it's fantastic. And, and I think that that sense of community is a huge, huge plus to this. And, and you, you guys need to do some gut checks in terms of saying, Jesus, is this a stupid idea or not? And you need to honestly answer each other back and say, yes, this is stupid. Let's not do this. Um, and, and do something safer. And I think that that's, you know, that, that really is, is one of the keys to making sure that we don't end up, with, not so much that we don't do things that we wouldn't do, but that we do them better and do them safer. And that, that's, that's a key. Yeah, I think you made an excellent point earlier, so Judith, about uh, a lack of mentoring. And yeah, well, when, you, when, you, when you have a lot of good people together, being in a situation where everyone is <coughs> trying to kind of decide if it's safe together. And I've been in that situation yeah. myself before. There was some actually a revolution in Egypt when, one day when the interior, the, the secret police headquarters was being overrun for the first time. And I was there with another freelancer um, for NPR, and participants were kind of going into the into this door that it opened up, and they were shooting, and okay, where well, the shooting, shooting was coming from, and she and I were kind of looking at each other, and, she, and we went in, we were like, are you going to go? Well, if you're going to go, I should go. We should go together, so we're, mm -hmm. so we're together. And, it, and we just, and it was us and actually a someone from Human Rights Watch, a young person made mm -hmm. a movie. The three of us kind of had this, you know, we were all, we were all like 28. Well, that, you know, with the whole Chris Hongo's Tim Heathering team thing, yeah. they were with five young people who were fairly inexperienced, and Chris said to one of them in particular, I can't let you go out alone. And then he ended up being killed. Yeah. But he himself knew he shouldn't, and he felt he needed to protect this person. Yeah. I'm not blaming anybody nor judging them, but it's an unfortunate state of yeah. the I mean, industry the, at the moment. There's the yeah. kind of freelance community that happens up here, and then there are these relationships you build with the three people around you, who are probably all also freelancers, and you're in a terrible situation together. But the, that's that, that's a hard place to be, and a hard place to determine you know, what to do. But the, the community, I think, is is absolutely key. I mean that. You know, whatever can strengthen that is really important because, you know, when I was kidnapped, it was the freelance and then the greater journalist community that was made all the difference. And, uh, you know, I can give you specific examples of that. There's a freelance filmmaker who was nominated for an Oscar. He did, I think, the best film out of Iraq called Iraq in Fragments, James Longley. And he had this relationship. He had gone to the South and he had, you know, built a relationship with the Medi Army folks in the South. And so when I was kidnapped, you know, all the freelancers lived in the Delaney Hotel, and you know, so we all knew each other. And he uh, he had the cell phone number to you know Sheikh uh, Sheikh Kapaji, who was the you know the Medi Army leader, and he would call him up and say, you know, can we see can we solve this situation? Because I was kidnapped by people who were sort of aligned with the Medi Army, and and you know, of course, it was all very cryptic. And he'd say, what situation? You know, and he'd say, well, there's a situation. You know, <laughs> but it it made a huge difference. You know, each, everybody in the, you know, hundreds of people were working at the, in their own way. And that massive, you know, it was like crowdsourcing. And, you know, anything that can be done to sort of strengthen it, and, you know, your organization sounds like it's doing a, a lot in that regard. So anything that can be done to strengthen and build networks is really the only thing. Because I, I, I do not, you know, I'm an optimist some of the times, but I, I feel that. You know the major news organizations with money are much. It's a much harder boat to turn than to maybe go the other way and start building upward. Um, you know, in terms of if you're looking for money or security, or, you know, the, the funds. Do you know, I build on that actually because uh, what we're trying to do is we 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 believe that freelancers need to organize themselves a bit better, um, and there's not a perception we're capable of doing it, but we're quite capable. Of um, and again, freelancers mentor each other and, and, and work together, and, and it's interesting you say that. I think freelancers have to show that we're serious, um, and then I think we might be able to get more engagement from the industry. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, we, we represent great value for money in, in covering wars and, and, and covering the world. So, you know, th th there's a sound economic argument for engaging freelancers. It doesn't have to be a, a, you know, for, for almost no money. It, it, you know, there, there is the money to pay freelancers reasonably, and we can still be competitive. Is there an honor roll or a role of shame to say who are the organizations who treat freelancers the best and who are the worst offenders? I think it's quite difficult to do, but it also changes because it often depends on the uh, relationships you may have and also whether you have allies in, in those organizations. Very often, you're, you're the people who really fight for you 
aren't the people sitting at desks. It's the people you meet on the story who are experienced and work with you and, and, and get to know you and see that you're doing your best and you're professional often. You might know more than them. Um, I, you know, I don't think any characterization that freelancers are less competent on front lines than uh, employed journalists is just simply inaccurate. Um, uh, the, the people deceiving themselves when they present it like that. Um, I, no, but I think uh, it's, it's really a case of um, us trying to demonstrate that we're, you know, we're, we're sort of capable of doing this properly. Should I open a, U, uh, a US chat? Yeah, that sounds a good idea. And volunteers, but there's nothing there. In the back, and then. <coughs> Um, earlier you said there's no prescription sort of way to look at uh, not getting into trouble, you know, when you're when you're abroad. But uh, I was kind of curious to know what the, you know. Uh, I was fascinated to learn that you know people with sickness is uh, oftentimes more the, the, you know, the larger cause of death than let's say you know being blown up. On the other hand, what's been covered more recently, you know, whether it be back in 2002 with Daniel Pearl or um, you know James Bull just just recently, is you know being kidnapped and executed on camera, but I, I, I was curious to know if there are any patterns uh, specifically related to being kidnapped. It seemed, if there was a mistake that was made um, time and time again, I, I understand that there's no way to completely avoid risk and no way to necessarily say that, blame anybody or say that you know, something was done wrong. I was just curious to know if any, either of these journalists, um, who both seemed actually relatively experienced, made, made, it, made many mistakes, like any mistakes along the way that might not be repeated, or it was just bad luck. Well, I mean, the, the other thing I can say is, you know, there's a, you know, the famous Robert Kappa quote is, you know, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. You also have to be Hungarian, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, th this is the problem is if you want a good story, you know, you have to get close. And, and there's, a, there's a line, you can feel it, that you're crossing, you know, to get close to, to you know, people who are not your friends. You know, you are going to cross a safety line, and you're going to put your safety in their hands. And, and you know, a lot of times it's fine, and then sometimes it's not. And the problem is, you know, if you want that story, you can't do anything about that. They're not going to meet you on your terms. You're going to meet them on their terms. And that's a challenge, and you have to decide whether or not you want that story. I mean, I'll give you an example. The um, uh, and this this one I can I can. I can use, you know, the names. When I was in uh, um, uh, Iraq the day before I was kidnapped, I was headed south. And um, I was just having lunch in the New York Times office with John Burns. And, you know, I was just telling him I wasn't really working with him. You know, we were sort of colleagues, friends, that sort of thing, you know, because I was interested. I published a couple stories in the New York Times. And I was just telling him where I was going. He's like, oh, you know, that's, that's interesting. And then um, uh, Sabrina Tavernis came in, and she she wanted to do a story about uh, Medi Army female fighters, and you know he thought long and hard about it, and he said, you know, that's just too dangerous right now. You can't go into that environment, and that that's one of the challenges. There was there's nobody overseeing me. It was my decision to head south and to, to try to follow the story, but you know with a large news organization, you know he he had many many years of experience, and you know he. He said, you know, that for her story that just sounded too dangerous. And I'm sure she was disappointed, but, you know, there are those kinds of decisions that are being made that may be the right decision, may not be the right decision. Um, but when you're on your own and you're making these decisions for yourself, you know, and, and a lot of it is about money. I mean, you know, if you have, if you have no money, I mean, I went to Iraq for the first time with $3,000 in my pocket. You know, it was, I had no money. And, you know, if you need to sell a story, you know, to pay your hotel bill. You know, th these are the real issues. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone ever, you know, I, I don't think people make mistakes. I think you think they're mistakes because of the outcome in the end. But I don't, you know, there, in my opinion, you know, there are no mistakes out because there's, there's n no way to know what's going on. There's no rules. You know, it's, it's, it's war. It's a conflict zone. There are no rules. You know, horrible things happen. And who they happen to is just, you know, I, I think it's more random than not. I think it's very, it, it, it ends up being very unhelpful when we take an instance where our colleagues have been killed and analyze it to death. Um, and it, it ends up often with the wrong lessons. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, the, the near misses never get, look, get looked at because they're just fun at the bar, you know. Uh, but I hadn't, didn't quite answer your question fully. 
There are organisations that I think really care about freelancers. Channel 4 in London, BBC are pretty good on occasions, depending on the editor. Um, uh, you know, there are some American ones. I think Global Post, I've worked for Global Post. You know, I mean, I, there are some good ones. I don't know the American ones as well. There was a question at the table here. It's really kind of going back to the mentoring. I'm, I'm a freelancer who's worked in the conflict zones, and I, I think when you freelance, what you also need to do is find your own mentors with many of the mainstream publications, but I was already writing for them, so it was easy to, and sometimes going on an assignment as a freelancer into like Afghanistan or into Iraq, but it's rare that I've ever found somebody who's on staff who doesn't want to mentor or advise, but you also... As a freelancer, you want to put yourself where the staff of publications are, other freelancers. The Alhambra Hotel, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, for example. And then at the end of the day, you can get advice from people. I think you you find ways to do things safely, but it's never guaranteed. And then you kind of bounce off people. Though I've only parachuted in and out. I've never actually been based in places. I think that's a really good point, and you know, attach yourself to, you know, be the nice guy that everybody yeah. wants in their jeep. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. you know, I, I think I think that's true, and I mm -hmm. think the human instinct. You know, when you're out there, the competition does fizzle a little bit, and I think mm -hmm. people do feel protective. Mm -hmm. I, I do. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And if you're the nice guy, they want in your jeep. You'll mm -hmm. get a jeep ride, and mm -hmm. you'll get the spare twin bed in their hotel room. You know, I think. Or maybe have some language skills, and that could be a you know a, an exchange you can do. But I, I think that's that that does make it safer. You attach yourself and endear yourself to people who do those sorts of things. Yeah, but we have tall, really tall, and, and, and larger students in the risk in the courses that we have, and inevitably the smallest people in the class want to carry around the tallest, big, biggest people in the class to see if they can do it. And it's a great conversation that usually happens between them. And after there's this big struggle, usually the small person says, man, I'm never going anywhere with you because I don't want to have to carry you. And the, and the big person says, yeah, but I can carry three or four of you. <laughs> and and it is a, it's a great exchange that, you know, that really highlights, like, what, what can you add to this? How are you trained? Can you save my life? Can I save yours? You know, because it, it is, a, you know, the community that's in the car with you. And that, that is valuable. I think we're getting close may to I, wrapping up. May I say... Uh, I'm Bill Holstein, president of the Overseas Press Club Foundation, which is affiliated with the OPC. This is Jane Riley, who's executive director. We give uh, 15 scholarships and internships uh, every year to uh, college students who want to become foreign correspondents. The deadline is December 1st, just a few weeks from now. Uh, our website is overseaspressclubfoundation.org. Foundation. Or you can also find us from the OPC website. And this year, for the first time, when we fly all the winners to New York, we're going to provide a day of situational awareness training uh, on the on the Saturday after our Friday luncheon. So, what's the name of the outfit in Washington that we're flying up? Global Security. Global uh, Security. Uh, so, so we are the largest of these organizations that bring young people in uh, to the, the the business and and give them internships on the ground in the bureaus of AP, Reuters, Global Post, and others. So, for the first time, we feel like we have a responsibility to also provide this training, so it be part of this conversation with you, so. So can I ask one question, does that, is that just the college students, or are our graduate students also? Graduate students. students. Most of the winners are graduate students. We, it doesn't matter what the nationality is, as long as you're enrolled in the United States and Canada, uh, we've also been taking some applications from European universities, so we have a pretty broad <coughs> footprint all across the country and, and Western Europe. Okay, great. Just, um, a uh, quick question: Do you do you all have positions on <clears throat> the blackout question, and whether you would advise for or against in kidnap situations? Because it seems to me, when you're asking about lessons learned, at least in some cases, there's been a shift away from the notion, and maybe Rob wants to speak to this as well, the notion that the media blackout was an automatically good thing, which in David's case lasted for seven months. Um, there seems to me to have been something to shift away from that, so I wanted to hear what you thought about it. I think you, David, and Rob are probably in the best position to address that. No. Well, yeah, we've, uh, sorry, I'm from the Committee of Tech Journalists. We are seriously looking at whether um, media blackouts are a, quote, good thing. And because uh, in one case, in some cases, they disguise the scale of the problem. When you had, at one point, the serious and 30 journalists uh, 
kidnapped. That wasn't public information. I, I don't know whether that was it. That served the causes of those, uh, the cases of those journalists. So um, I think it's it's up to each individual uh, uh, freelance and each individual uh, news organizations to make their own decision because it's it's their person that's on the line. But I I, I seriously question whether uh, you know the uh, the automatic compliance with the blackout request. Uh, should 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 be the norm for that one. Uh, I'll actually I'll, I'll I'll give you a different perspective on that. Um, I actually I, I had some pretty strong feelings about this because um, I think it's very different. The rules apply differently to freelancers than they do to people who are employees of major news organizations. Mm -hmm. If you're working for a big news organization, the editor of that organization can call the other dozen and say blackout. They don't do that for freelancers. There's nobody by the time. The families gotten together and tried to figure things out. There's no way, and a lot of times, all the major news organizations need is it appears in some tiny local paper, and then they go, "Oh, it's been published there, and now it's news." So I, I saw, I looked at the cases of freelancers who were kidnapped, and I looked at the cases of you know people who are employees of major news organizations, and there's a difference. There is a double standard, and I think that double standard needs to be addressed. And I don't know if it's being addressed now in the last couple of years, but it's definitely there. So. I think I'd, I'd like to add, uh, in, in Britain, um, we've held quite a few events discussing this issue, and we've spoken to families. And <coughs> it's very clear that the British government, the British Foreign Office, pressure these families quite hard uh, to frighten them off, effectively, uh, from speaking to journalists. And, and it is actually frightening it off. I mean, the way we are portrayed to those families is not very, um, very, 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 very good, really. Um, anyway. Um, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, I, th I have this uh, big worry that this makes it very convenient and easier for the Foreign Office because they never seem to have a, 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 a real responsibility. Um, they certainly don't have pressure from journalists that, and the family are, are, are more isolated as a consequence. So I, I think government's quite like um, not having to uh, worry about it. What do you think from the Global Post? I mean, you've dealt with the Foley family. Yeah, I, um, I'd defer to David on this one, too, because I think he's, he's really got a very well thought out position on it. From our, from our experience, everything would be off the record, I'd, I'd ask, because at the end of the day, it's up to um, it's up to the families, really, how best to do that. And I think you, you want to be guided by that, but then you want to evaluate what's the most practical and best way to go forward with this. And I think there is a rethinking of that going on, and we're part of that. It was a blackout for a while, but also Jim Foley was, I would argue, put in some peril by blackout. There were many colleagues who'd been kidnapped, and we didn't know about that. So there's a danger in the blackout of, of not knowing what's happening with Danish and Spanish and other journalists who we just didn't have any contact with. Um, so I, I think David maybe could, could um, speak most profoundly on this, but I did want to ask, share one thing at the end, but after you do. Uh, if I could put you on the spot. <laughs> I've heard, I mean, you've, you've been really thinking it out. And no, no, I, 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 I sort well. of, so there's a proposal from CBJ about that we report about kidnapping cases, maybe give the nationality of the journalists, say they've been kidnapped, but not necessarily name them. I mean, the, there are, you know, there is elements, well, first of all, I think the blackout started as a well-intentioned idea that this was going to somehow facilitate negotiations that when there was publicity it raised expectations of ransom. Um, and that didn't work. Blackouts do not facilitate negotiations. Um, I don't think publicity will work either in terms of you're not going to like shame these people into releasing them. And it's also not a game because the Foley's were sort of told by their captors, as was my family, to do a blackout. And if there wasn't a blackout, that they would harm the captive. Um, and then there are cases such as Stephen Sotloff's where certain information was not made public, particularly his Israeli citizenship, and that really would have endangered him. So I like very much the CPJ idea of reporting it. If there's a persuasive case for the family, why not to name the person? If they've written some things that might, you know. But I do agree that what happened in Syria was wrong, to have 30 people kidnapped. Uh, freelancers went into Syria who didn't realize there had been that many kidnappings and got kidnapped themselves. So it's very difficult. No publicity or publicity doesn't 
solve these cases, I, as I said once earlier. The only thing that ends these kidnappings, unfortunately, is cold hard cash. So, Charlie. You know, it's, it's the impossible question of the day. We've just gone through incredible uh, experience um, in losing Jim Foley and, and seeing the way he was murdered, seeing his incredibly strong family go through that. It's really been a searing and sobering experience. But I think, in the end of the day, um, you know, the, the, it's very hard to not understand the will of that family to want to pay, to want to do whatever is necessary to get their son home. And I have four sons, and I'm telling you right now, I would want to pay. That said, I, I deeply respect and understand U.S. government position. I mean, that how and how do you ever want to be part of facilitating the Islamic State and creating a cottage industry for kidnapping of colleagues so that they can continue to do the work they do in the world? It's one of those um, amazingly complex moral questions that make me think that we, you know, we have to spend more time thinking about these. We have to spend more time as colleagues. And there's a lot of that going on. We, we have a lot of things in work, including this event and more. Um, but I, I wanted to add one thing, which is that um, Global Post uh, has also a companion nonprofit that I'm heading up now called the Ground Truth Project. Ground Truth Project is dedicated to providing training and mentoring for the next generation of correspondents to do work that can make a difference. So forget who said it. It might have, it might have been you, Bon, when you said we can't stop doing the work. So if we're not going to stop doing the work, and I just came back from Iraq, and I was there on the ground with colleagues you know, who, who understand the rising peril, we can't stop. But we do need to think about how we're going to do it. And we need to think a lot more about that. We need to provide more resources, more training. And we have to come up with ways to do it safely. Ground Truth wants to really be an organization that will put its oar in the water along with Frontline, along with OPC Foundation and OPC and um, CPJ for sure, and all of the news organizations that are part of this. This is, a, this is a time to seize the moment of Jim's death and Steve Sotloff's death, and all of the tragedy we've had in the last few years. It's been endless. I can't tell you how many friends we all have who we know from the field. So there's a, there's a, there's a point in time here that we need to recognize it's a moment upon us to seize on all of this energy and really affect change. So I want to just thank OPC for putting this together. This is part of, part of that movement. Um, Vaughn and CPJ, everyone is doing everything they can, so we just need to keep going in that direction. Just to add to that, I mean, tomorrow we have a, a meeting, a bunch of us tomorrow at the Times, to hopefully um, keep this ball going too. Um, I think we have to work in lots of different arenas to do it, uh, so I hope we will be able to capitalize on the moment. Um, from the LPC point of view, the second thing we're doing is uh, we, we hope to rededicate ourselves to uh, providing services like Frontline does in the UK uh, for freelancers in particular. Uh, something that um, our membership traditionally, you know, but the industry's changed in the U.S. And so there's a time if you're a foreign correspondent, you worked for a big media organization. That is less and less the case now. So we're trying to pivot the OPC to provide the services that freelancers need. So Liam actually is uh, on that committee. Um, and so, you know, let us know. Uh, Liam.stackandnytimes.com. Uh, uh, the, the needs you have as freelancers uh, and the other freelancers have, let us know so we can provide those services to Yeah, we'd love to, to chat. Great stuff. Can I ask a question? I just wanted to ask, uh, we talked about freelancers taking responsibility for their own safety. Could the panel uh, address the, the issue of freelancers also taking safety, uh, uh, responsibility for the safety of those who, the services they use, uh, local journalists who they may hire as uh, fixers or interpreters or drivers, and can speak a little of, of the other side of this which is freelancers uh, relying on local journalists. But is it a particular freelance problem, or is it a... Well, we were, talking about, we were talking about freelancers here. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be staff costs. Because um, I, I, I remember in Kosovo, uh, nearly all the broadcasters are in Kosovo before the Serbs came in, left all their freelancers. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, it's a wider industry responsibility for you. But 
the, the, fi the fixers. And we, we have something called the Fixers Fund. Well, only we stopped calling it the Fixers Fund at Frontline in London. Because um, we uh, shockingly discovered that uh, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and that general area, a fixer is the term for a pimp. So nobody was applying for any funding. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously that was slightly problematic. But um, we now call it the Frontline Fund. But, but actually, we, you know, I think it is important. And, and I think uh, that freelancers do need to realize they, 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 they have a responsibility to the people they're working with because they couldn't really work without them. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, sorry. <laughs> Which is not as complicated, right? Because on the one hand, I think as a, so speaking just as a former freelancer myself, you end up feeling in some ways closer to your fixer than you do to, you know, the, the staff correspondent who lives in the big villa in the suburb, maybe you don't know. You know, you, you build a stronger relationship, but you also materially have less ability to help the fixer if something goes wrong. You, you know, because you're, you're up against the wall yourself. So it is complicated. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, it's, that's a relationship that, that has to be respected on both sides. And when I was kidnapped, I was actually kidnapped with my and I hate the word fixer or translator. He was a colleague, you know, an Iraqi colleague who I, you know, I, he's brilliant. And, you know, we were there together the whole time, and it was sort of us in there together, and we were both released. So, you know, you, you develop relationships, you know, it, it all, and I think a lot of, um, a lot of freelancers, because, yeah, they're, you know, th these are the people who you rely on. The relationships are pretty close. I, I, I think it's probably <coughs> different with major news organizations, maybe there's more of a distance, but I, I, I tend to find that freelancers have very um, trusting and close relationships. But um, I, I actually, I wanted to just respond to one point there. I, I do respectfully disagree on that point about the, the government's role. Um, I think... Which point, sorry? About the ransoms. I think... The government's ransom. position that, that paying funds yeah. the Islamic State? just pay the ransom, deal with it. The person is more important than any geostrategic political agenda. You know, there's so much money, full, you know, going in from you know all sorts of places, oil. You know. Yep, I wouldn't disagree at all. I just yeah. think, what do you do about the perverse incentive that creates for that organization then to go full headlong into the industry of kidnapping all of us? It hasn't stopped sure. the kidnapping, has it? No, I, I mean, it hasn't. But I think. I wonder if the European governments held the line, if there wouldn't be less of it. Um, and there's a whole other tier to this, which is corporate uh, oil industry executives. They pay. They, they pay, pay yeah. routinely. Even, if they're, even the if they're Americans, if you well, go through the companies that sure. release no, you, I know. you know, they'll, they'll organize the payment to so, um, I want to be really clear. I don't know the answer. I, I, I know the Foley's, and I know, I know they're right about what they want to do, because that's their son. And I, I support whatever the family wants to do. So in the news organization, I think we need to do our best to be there for the families. We need to, to really try our best to just stand alongside them. But we can't break the law either. So well, I, I think it know. was pretty shocking that the government, you know, the allegations which haven't been investigated, but that they put pressure on the family not to pay, I think that is completely shocking. And I hope there's a serious investigation. That's there's going. To that happened to a friend money was taken captive in Somalia quite a while ago, and um, her mother was just dealing with State Department or you know, that FBI, whatever. And she knew where uh, our colleague's checkbook was. And in those days, they didn't ask that much money. It was a little bit insulting how little they asked. <laughs> and they instructed her not to. There was some communication back and forth with the captive, and they instructed her, the U.S. government instructed her, do not hand the check over. And, um, I mean, eventually our colleague was released, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm with you on that. I mean, people's lives are worth, you know. Micah, do you, let me ask you, because you've been in this situation, do you take out K&R insurance now when you work freelance? Well, you know, that's one of those things of, you know, if I did, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Some of this should probably be with, I mean, this is very sensitive information. So yeah. I, I, all, all I'll say is that kind of thing is extremely expensive for freelancers if they even wanted to do it. It's really difficult. It's not easy. It's not like a life, you know, health insurance, life mm -hmm. insurance. Um, so it's, it's not really readily accessible to most freelancers. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I wish it was. I wish it was an easy thing to do um, because, you know, I think it's important for everybody to have that. But 
I mean, I used to go into Iraq with no insurance at all, at all, no health insurance, nothing. And so, and it was it wasn't because I was irresponsible. I just literally had no money. Does my fifty dollars go to this or to that? So I think one of the things um, that we'll be discussing in the near future, and we need to keep discussing, is how do we create a pool fund? Is there a way to do that? Is there a way to create some policy, some pool? insurance policies that can be of benefit to many and bring the price way down and, and get coverage. And I think it's something that, yeah. it's going to be complicated. It's going to take a lot of time, but we have to do it. We have to think it out. I've been working on that for about 20 years. Now. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, that's part, part is it different for UK pay. than US? Or no, it's, the, the, problem, is... it's act, the problem is quite a simple problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it's about numbers. Insurance is all about numbers. Um, policy only becomes affordable when you've got enough people subscribing to it. Um, and uh, in a sense, uh, it can only be achieved if we can get enough uh, enough broadcasters to support it, broadcast news organizations. And we've never got enough to actually do it. Um, uh, but we've, we've looked at these policies uh, with Roy Peck Trust, we've looked at them, and, and, and we were planning next year, if I was planning to have a real go next year, early next year, January, February, trying to do it. We wanted to achieve some things first. Yeah. I, but I think, that, I think it's all about getting broadcast supported. If, if they all come together, news organizations, say, we want this to happen, um, we'll speak to our insurance. Who are we using for insurance? Is there a way that we can tap something else on? It, it, freelancers are prepared to pay for this. It right. just should exist. Um, yeah. There needs to be a product out there that is affordable and there can be real. Yes, yeah, so I guess we'll wrap up now, but I'm sure the conversation will continue. Um, yeah, we so have much. to vacate the room at 8 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so really what, what are they talking about yeah. after that? Yeah. Or just, do you want to make a little plug the or? Uh, No, I, thank you all for coming. I think. Um, you know, what we said here states argument itself, doesn't it, uh, for the success of this community on uh, uh, us working together as our organizations for that purpose. So that's a good point. So should all join the University Press Club. And as Liam says, as a young person, should all join the I'm old, so listen to me. <laughs> and register with Frontline. Yeah. Frontline. Yeah. Really great.